Do we live in a singular universe or are we inhabiting a sea of an infinite array of them of which this one is only one? My guest today is an expert on this topic and talks about how for thousands of years people have wondered at this question and what the implications of the answers are. This question and more coming up next on Beyond Belief. Hi, Professor Rubenstein. It is so great to have you here today. And I've been looking forward to this conversation for a really long time. And um, you are a professional philosopher, uh, which puts you in a category of, of professional that I think is very rare and uh, very unique and, and fascinating. And in just thinking over what it is that you study, you know, I, I looked at an etymological dictionary, you know, what does philosophy mean? And it's most of the definitions seem to say that it's a love of wisdom. And my opening question for you is, that makes sense to me, but what is wisdom? How, how would you define what wisdom is itself and, and why we study that? Goodness. Well, I should say, <laughs> <laughs> great question. Um, I should say that I, uh, I, I am a philosopher and I'm the kind of philosopher who thinks about religion. Um, I'm a, I am specifically a philosopher of religion rather than a philosopher of language or a, uh, a philosopher of um, aesthetics or um, even ethics, even though these things all, all come into, into play with one another. Um, philosophy, yes, love of wisdom. Um, we also know from um, from the Hebrew Bible that uh, the, the fear of the Lord is said to be the beginning of wisdom. So there are ways that uh, religion and philosophy uh, kind of uh, intersect with one another, even in just this just this word wisdom. Um, wisdom. This isn't a definition, but I have a sort of associational cloud with it, and maybe that's okay. Um, my associational cloud with wisdom is uh, includes the capacity for uh, slowness, the capacity mm. to consider numerous positions and perspectives on a question um, without immediate partisanship, um, mm -hmm. position to turn over uh, a question from a number of different, um, again, perspectives, um, the uh, and the capacity to um, discern what the most important question is to ask in any given situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then and then the sort of forbearance to uh, receive uh, different kinds of uh, input into that question. Um, I, I guess that would be it. It would be uh, honing in on the question, um, the capacity to hone, to, 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 to um, find the question and abide the question and abide the difficulties of difficult questions, the discomfort that uh, it throws you into. Um, mm -hmm in a kind of sea of uncertainty. And that's, I think, where philosophy tends to throw us and hold us. I think that was a very good answer. You know, would you say that it also impacts the way you behave, how you execute on what you've understood? Is there a, is there a part of wisdom that's about living, you know, or is it just about cognition? Right. Um, I think many of us in the kind of westernized, um, modernized world have this sense that we have to know what we're doing before we do it. That you know, you you gain the wisdom and then you know how to proceed or something like that. That the, the internal state precedes the external state. Um, but I don't think that this is usually the case. I think usually what happens is you live in the world and you act, and that action then produces uh, the internal state of either foolishness or wisdom or whatever it is. Um, so in that in that sense, what wisdom would be would be the capacity to um, learn to to attend to what it is that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm and to learn from what it is that we're doing and then maybe to change course and to do things differently. Um, so it would it had, it get, it get us into a kind of uh, reciprocal relationship with, with uh, the way that we act in the world. Okay, I like that a lot. And um, I, I wanna share with you that I occasionally get accused of flattering my guests, um, <laughs> but it's, it's just not the case. And I'll, I, I'll explain why. I, I wouldn't invite somebody on if I didn't think that what they have done is really, really interesting. Um, and in, in your case, you know, I, I have not read everything that you've uh, created, but I have read uh, this, this book, Worlds Without End. And I have to just tell you, this, this is a magnificent book. 
and yeah. however that comes across, it just is. And um, and what you've introduced me to is the knowledge that this question of of having many worlds mm -hmm. is ancient. <laughs> And I had conceived of it as being this relatively modern, you know, um, conception. And um, and subsequently, you know, after uh, reading this and really, again, thoroughly enjoying it, um, I, I find I, I'm so much more educated on the concept. And I want to read you a quote that you wrote in the book, um, oh. to get a couple of questions on it. But you say, the fine tuning problem which is, which is the concept uh, that there are certain parameters that are set in the constants of the universe, the rate of gravitation, this weak and strong nuclear force, so on and so forth. They're set at such a precise rate that it's confusing to people how they ended up like that. But anyway, you say the fine tuning problem opened the door to an all powerful deity who sets the controls just right. To be sure this argument is not properly scientific Yet it is encroached on the physicist's terrain with increasing insistence over the past 50 years or so, provoking frustration in most of them, acceptance in a few, and abject rage in others. So, first of all, well written. My question is, why frustration and rage as opposed to something like intrigue or curiosity? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Why the frustration and the rage? So just to just to back up a little bit, right? The fine the, the so-called fine-tuning problem, as as you've begun to say, is uh, it stems from the question of why the universe seems so beautifully suited to life when any other arrangement of the fundamental constants of nature um, would pr produce a universe either that didn't work or that didn't have stars or that didn't like that or that maybe had a couple stars but not enough to produce life like why is it that the universe is so uh, exquisitely um, calibrated that we have all of this instead of absolutely nothing um, the easiest answer for those of us who are sort of trained up in the traditions that you know western folks are trained up in is well there's a god there's like a god who's a cosmic dj and he's like okay we're gonna have like this much gravity we're gonna have this much weak nuclear <laughs> force, and he kind of like mixes it all together and then right um and uh so again physicists tend there are a number of physicists who say all right i guess there's there's some kind of god who has set this um set the parameters just right um the rest of them uh get again, either frustrated or angry, um, because I think that they have this sense, having trained as physicists in the 20th and now 21st century, um, that religion and philosophy have nothing to do with one another. So that it's a category mistake to answer a, a physical question with a religious answer. Right? Um, that's, I think, the problem. It's as though you, I think to the physicists, it's as though you went to the refrigerator looking for an orange and somebody said, here's some scotch tape. And you're like, what? This isn't even within the realm of what I was looking for, right? This is <laughs> right. right. That's the thing. That's but the it's thing. what you found. But it's what, right, it's what you found. But like, this is not what I was looking for, right? I think that the, um, this isn't quite, this goes a little bit beyond what you were asking, but I, I think that the, um, it's, it's a kind of tragic comedy of errors, right? That um, physicists themselves ask this question, why is it that the universe is so exquisitely calibrated for life? And then get annoyed by an answer um, when it may be that like there's something kind of funky about the question, that there's something a little a little strange about the question. Um, and by strange, I mean, there's something metaphysical about the question. It's not just an ordinary question of physics to ask why is there is why is there isness rather than right. notness? That's not a question like how do we get the ball to roll down the hill faster? That's of a different kind of order from usual questions of, of modern physics. Um, so the issue seems to me to be that the physicists are uh, in spite of themselves, unintentionally, they don't know this because they haven't been trained as philosophers, right? Or even mm -hmm. in a couple classes in philosophy because of the way that we track the disciplines these days. What they don't understand is that the question that they're asking is already a metaphysical one. They're all, when they ask why this, rather, they're already asking questions about what's beyond the universe, right? And then they get surprised and annoyed when they get a metaphysical answer to a metaphysical question, right? But it's a metaphysical uh, question. And this is, this is, this is the reason that, that, that we're there. Isn't that true of all scientific questions? Isn't it the case that science produces through experimentation, you know, facts and 
and that's it. You know, it, it seems that if you take it any step further than that, to me, you've gone into the world of philosophy, um, as you're as you're pointing out. You know, so it's curious to me. I mean, and maybe you're saying it's just an emotional thing, but you know, once we've produced a set of facts, it can be put on a piece of paper, and like you know, I think the the physicist maybe would just check out at that time and say, well, here's what we discovered, and mm -hmm. and maybe leave it to the philosophers and the theologians perhaps to start right. debating what the import is of it. Um, but isn't this question, therefore, ultimately, isn't it just an inference from science as opposed to science itself? Mm -hmm. One could imagine, um, and there are, again, there are some physicists who do this. There are some physicists saying, you know, thus far can I take you and no further. <laughs> this is, this is, and now I will hand the rest over to, um, to people who know how to deal with um, metaphysics better better than I do. Um, there are also numerous um, physicists in particular right now, but really at, at their boundaries, um, biology tumbles into these metaphysical questions too at its boundaries. It's really like at the limits of, there are plenty of physicists who just wanna stay within the realm of the how and the what, and not at all the why, right? And who will say of these theoretical physicists, this is absolutely absurd. Why are you even, why would you even, this isn't even a scientific discipline. This is something else, right? You're situated constitutively too close to philosophy, too close to myth, too close to religion, too close to science fiction, whatever it is. Um, and uh, so, um, I'm very sorry. Remind me of the question you asked. <laughs> um, isn't this a philosophical? It's a philosophical inference from science. Oh, right. as so why not just let it be itself. a philosophical interest? Right. Um, why not let it be a philosophical inference? Because um, it, it is my sense that um, many of the theoretical physicists who are <clears throat> concerned with cosmology not only think that what they are up to is independent of philosophy and religion, um, but also that it's a substitution for it. It's a replacement mm -hmm. of it. It is a, um, an advancement of it. And that uh, religion and then philosophy are antiquated ways of knowing about the world and that science has now replaced it. Um, so there just is no room for them. There's no, um, particularly when you're talking about causation, right? Um, and when you're talking about like the, 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 the world or something like that. So they couldn't possibly give it over um, to uh, the, the philosophers and the religionists because there's no room left for them because science is, has won or something like that, right? Right, right. Yeah, I, uh, I interviewed um, Professor James Tartaglia uh, a few weeks back and um, in a little bit he was lamenting, you know, the, the, the fact that philosophy has sort of lost its mojo in, in modern times and like has taken such a seemingly such a backseat to science um, that it, it's having trouble like recalibrating how to be culturally relevant, you know, in, in the same way that it once was. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think it is. I think and I think personally that science um, knowingly or unknowingly can't do without it and, mm -hmm. and is engaging in it, whether they feel like it or not. Right. Um, <clears throat> so it maybe it'll be an interesting thing to point out for, you know, over many years and see if it gets absorbed that they are doing some philosophy uh, by hook or by crook. But I have one more question on, on the multiverse concept and then I'll move on to something else. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm just curious how you feel about it personally, um, given that it, it seems to me that the, the implications of this question are so huge. Mm -hmm. um, how should a person decide to act, you know, in, in the meantime? You know, who knows, it's been going on for centuries, um, it's not settled. A person has to decide how to behave. Um, what what do you do? Because you know it's the difference between well, it's you know blind random forces uh, accidentally created all that there is, um, mm -hmm. or you know, this very purposeful, um, meaning oriented existence that we find ourselves in is all planned and and designed. I mean that you couldn't have a a greater dichotomy than that. Mm -hmm. Well, no. On the one hand, no. Um, on the other hand. Well, two things. The, the the less interesting thing is, if you want to hold on to the notion of an all-powerful, personal, loving, intelligent creator, um, you can have that in the multiverse too. You can absolutely uh -huh. have that in the multiverse too. All you need to do is say God created the multiverse, right? So you can right. always 
um, you know, stick a God hat onto whatever it is that science is telling us. So there's no there's no real need to choose um, mm -hmm. purely for a person who's um, who's uh, got you know some investment in um, in a theistic uh, worldview. Absolutely, you can, you can have both of them. Um, but even if uh, even if one seems uh, they, 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 even if they seem to be sort of competing paradigms, um, one being uh, a kind of uh, I think the big difference the big difference is not so much is there a god or not the big difference is uh, how many worlds do we live in like what's out there that's I think that's the big difference um, and that, so the question is more does it matter um, whether we affirm this universe as the only universe or whether we affirm other universes in addition to this universe. Again, whether or not you put a God hat on top of it, right? Um, and there, I, if the, um, I, I can't. I, I cannot answer this question. I, <laughs> I can't answer it in any kind of satisfying ontological way. Which is to say, I cannot tell you whether there's a multiverse or not. Nobody can tell you whether there. It's not just that I'm not trained in physical cosmology. Nobody can tell you whether there's a multiverse or not. People can make arguments one way or the other. There's evidence, of course, but the thing that counts as evidence for somebody counts as space dust for somebody else. So there's, there's, right. I, I'm going to like give away the the, the punchline here and just say that nobody's going to be able to tell you whether or not there's a multiverse. Um, but I think it does help to ask what it is that the idea of the multiverse does for us. And the thing that's frustrating to me is that the thing that the idea of the multiverse seems to do for so many theoretical physicists is disprove the idea of God. And right. it just doesn't. It just doesn't. It, for reasons that I can talk about, but I don't have to. But it, it doesn't. So then what are, what, what, what does it do? Um, I think that it uh, it can um, at its best, the multiverse notion, um, can be a goad toward wonder and amazement and contemplation at the vastness of the universe, mm -hmm. possibility of possibility, and to allow us to think about what life might look like in totally different keys and what planets might look like in a to under totally different conditions. And if that, if the multiverse allows us to sort of think creatively um, that way about other possibilities, delightful. If on the other hand, um, your, your multiversalism leads you to uh, assert that uh, all of um, the physical world around us and all humanity and all consciousness and everything is all uh, a simulation, right? And that we have uh, universes upon universes simulated by simulators and that's our kind of model of the multiverse. Um, and therefore, because everything's a simulation, you may as well not be a decent person and you may as well make as much money as you possibly can because interesting people are the kinds of people whom simulators want to simulate. So you should, <laughs> should right. Horrible. Then I think it is a terrible idea to affirm the idea of a multiverse. So I guess I, 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 I get thrown again back upon the question, which is, um, what work is the multiverse doing for you? Um, and uh, and under circum certain circumstances, I think it's a wonderful thing to, to, to affirm. And, and under certain other things, I think that we need to focus instead on um, building just local communities <laughs> around us. Right, right, right. You know, great, great way of looking at it. And, and thank you for that thorough and interesting answer. Um, let's, let's pivot for a moment. Um, I... I come from a um, monotheistic understanding of the way the world is. Um, and, you know, I've certainly in my exploration of, of the philosophical world come up, uh, come up against this concept of, of pantheism, um, which, which you've, you've spoken about um, on occasion. And one, one thing you mentioned in one of your videos that, that stuck with me is he sort of um, lamented the, what you call the Western world's hold on God, um, which you described as, at the time, that dude in the sky. Um, and I, I'm curious, is, is that how you understand the, I, don't, I doubt it is, but that, the mono, monotheistic conception of, of the world, or you're being, you're being funny, is, um, you're you're trying to make a point, and if so, wh what point are you trying to draw out when you when you say that? Yeah, um, yeah, it is it is it is a flippant way to talk about the God of say Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to call him that dude in the sky. I <laughs> firm and understand this. Um, when I um, lament 
the Western world's hold on God. Um, what I am lamenting is a particular form of uh, imperial monotheism okay. that crafted itself for the purpose of invalidating other ways of thinking about the world. Um, so I'm thinking specifically of um, a conversional form of um, empire aligned Christianity um, that is not particularly theologically sophisticated, um, mm -hmm. right? Itself is itself a, a, a rather frightening reduction of the <laughs> complexity of God. Um, and that presents um, this particular God and a, a, a uh, you know a messianic way to that God um, as the only uh, way to live on this earth or uh, after this earth. Um, the reason I uh, get glib and call him the dude in the sky is that um, for those imperial purposes. Um, the God of, uh, you know, of salvation and of wonder and of awe and of signs and wonders um, gets reduced uh, to a, um, a kind of reflection of a, um, an earthly uh, emperor or king mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. and starts, look, starts looking like uh, whoever the, um, the emperor is. Um, and so that for those humans who don't have the luxury that the rest of us do to go diving into um, Torah and Talmud and Augustine and Aquinas and like figure out those theological complexities, mm -hmm. um, God looks just like the most powerful man around, um, whether that's the king or the emperor or um, one's father or something. And I think that the, the, the consequences for um, non-Western communities, the consequences for um, folks who either aren't men or aren't that kind of men <laughs> have been pretty disastrous. So um, I, I, when I when I decry the dude in the sky, I'm not um, lambasting, again, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'm, I'm lambasting the, the, the figurehead whom Western imperialism has made that God into. Understood. Okay. Um, pantheism... Mm -hmm. um, in my understanding, you know, it strikes me a bit as sort of like a God light system, if you will. Like, um, it seems like you get like all the good vibes, you know, but oh. none of the, none of the expectations or like oversight or responsibility and, and that kind of thing. Do you, do you think that that and I, I seem to recall in, in a video that I saw of yours, you said something like we need we need like a better pantheism or something along those lines. Um, is there anything, do you think, to what I'm saying? Like, what, I, what's the distinction in your mind between monotheism and pantheism? Um, I, and and is, part of it, is, is part of the rejection in some people's minds of, of the monotheistic approach the not wanting to be overseen by, by some force? Oh, oh OK, OK. So um, I try to uh, distinguish, when I go to talk about pantheism, I try to distinguish between um, what William James calls a monothe uh, like a monistic pantheism and pluralistic pantheism. Um, the monistic pantheism is the pantheism that says like everything is one. We are all connected. My arm is your arm, and your love is my love, and we're this and that, and we're all the same, and everything's the same, and we're all united. And, and William James is like ah. I don't know. We don't all seem to be good. <laughs> we seem to have a lot of differences. We seem to have a lot of strife. We seem to have a lot of disconnections. And of course, all things are composed by and related to a whole bunch of things, but all things aren't all things. All things are like a bunch of things, and they're also not a bunch of other things, right? Um, and so James says, you know, if we're going to think about pantheism, which he thinks that we should for a number of reasons, um, we should think about a pluralistic pantheism, which is to say just a riot of agents of like sacred agents of agents of what the western world calls divinity which is to say creation sustenance destruction um strewn throughout the universe as the universe lots of them not just one right not just three not just one as three not just two no right but like tons but just that everything that is participates to some degree in the ongoing creation and sustenance and destruction and recreation of the world. 
Okay. It's something more like a pluralistic pantheism. From this perspective, I think two things go away. The first thing that goes away is the no, is the the god lightness the, the god lightness of that of the notion of pantheism that we're like all connected so we should all just like tune in to the the flow of it. Um, uh, why do we lose it? Because um, if we are not invested in saying that all things are one, mm -hmm. also don't need to be invested in saying that all things are somehow good or that they're all uh, on our side or that there are. But, the agents, the, the, the gazillion agents in the world um, operate toward different goals and with different means and toward different ends and at odds with one another. And it, um, so uh, it's not a particularly rosy way of looking at the world at all. It's, a, it's actually a fairly sober way of seeing that um, there are all sorts of forces in the world and we need to figure out um, which ones uh, we are prepared to throw our lot in with and which ones we are prepared to oppose um, and fight, uh, and and so that's that 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 I think is a um, it's again it's a, it's a more sober and more um, I think complex uh, notion of of pantheism. Um, infamously, Einstein was a was a pantheist um, and had this you know general relativity view of the whole cosmos as like intricately co connected, and he was in ab like, just absolute wonder and awe at it all the time. Time, um, mm -hmm. we couldn't handle was quantum mechanics because it was so random and divided and you couldn't predict it ahead of time and it was and you couldn't um, there was no there's no sort of continuity with the classical world um, and one thing I try to suggest in this book that I wrote about pantheism is that if Einstein had really like carried his pantheism all the way through you know the wonder at the harmony of the cosmos and like the terror of the disunity of the cosmos would yeah. be too of his pantheism right um so we we need it, it's not it's not just wonder in a good way it's it's wonder in that sort of horrified way too um as far as the responsibility thing goes uh, yeah it may be that the the, the kind of all is one type pantheists um might fe uh just be looking to get rid of oversight um my sense of the the more sort of pluralistic pantheism is that it kind of multiplies your responsibility outward infinitely, um, so that rather than just being responsible to God, um, you're responsible in this sort of like Levinasian way to like everywhere God shows up, right? And not just humans, right? But um, but the whole but the whole universe, the whole cosmos. I. Uh, recently came upon my four-year-old uh, hitting a tree with a stick. And I was like, you cannot hit that tree with a stick and felt it as, um, as, as, uh, seriously and as dramatically as though he were you know desecrating some kind of sacred site um and uh so it it, it, it feels to me more of like a, a a sort of fragmenting out of responsibility than a uh, shirking of it okay and just two quick observations on that and, and we can move on with the uh it seems to me that if you push the einstein approach to its logical conclusions it seems to become polytheism as opposed to pantheism um, and, and also, I do think personally that it that it emerges from monotheism. What you're saying about the tree, um, you know, the, the, you know, at least Jews are taught to say the world was created for me, you know, and that doesn't mean in a selfish way. It means that it means I, it's my responsibility, and that's the entire world, right? So, um, you know, we have this notion that you know, like it says in the book of Isaiah, that you know, God, you know, cre forms light and creates darkness, right? So it, that the the one entity one being is doing the whole kit and caboodle of you know uh, and orchestrating both the seemingly bad and the good you know um and and that needs to be contended with and it may and we'll get into that maybe uh, in a few minutes but um you, uh, your explanations are once again very on very interesting and and very good so thank you for that and, and now i'd like to ask you a question about math um <laughs> oh no <laughs> um okay let me read you a quote Okay. Math religion, really. Okay, so the, uh, the, um, the quote is the following. A world-class mathematician of our times, Edward Frankel, professor of mathematics at UC Berkeley, explains in a 2013 book intended for a wide audience that most professional mathematicians today understand their task as an exploration 
of a non-material platonic world of abstract ideas, a world outside observable and measurable time and space that consists of pre-existing mathematical truths that have existed for eternity. In other words, human beings do not create the mathematical reality that some of the most gifted among human beings are able to perceive. I believe that the platonic world of mathematics is separate from both the physical world and the mental world existing as a world of its own outside both matter and human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is something. That's something, right? Okay, so my, I, I, I'll ask you for your reflections on that as a mathematical principle and then extend it into your area of expertise, which is religion. Is religion also discovered or is it created? Is there a distinction between these two concepts in that regard? Okay. Um, let me work backwards if that's okay. Sure. Is religion discovered or is it created? Um, I think it's created. I think that it's, I think it's created. I think that religion is, um, at least that's the easiest answer um, because it's one that I can demonstrate. It may be created and discovered, but it's certainly created. <laughs> that religion, okay. um, the ways that we have for um, marking off time and space as uh, particularly important, right, as sacred, as different from other kinds of time and other kinds of space um, are the product of human ingenuity that um, the the texts that we read, that the prayers that we recite, that the um, litanies that we come up with are all the product, again, of, you know, a human communities ingenuity. Um, I think it would be hard to defend uh, the notion that um, that somehow these rites and these even these texts uh, have have come down to us and that we've just unearthed them. Um, we participate in in creating them and making them and I don't think that that in any way takes away from their sacrality. It's in fact what makes sacred things sacred is a human investment in them um, and a continuity of practice over time and a, um, so I think it's from that position because it would be you'd be very hard pressed at this point to find, um, religious practitioners from any of the major monotheisms um, who uh, who would say, um, you know, who are also intellectually engaged with their own traditions, who would say, no, this stuff has come to us totally unfiltered from the divine. Sure. Right? Sure. Um, and yet, you find mathematicians who say this. This is fantastic. Like this, I find this absolutely fascinating because what it means is that the mathematicians are more um, theological than the religious folks are at the moment, right? That they um, have conviction that what they're doing is just discerning the truth of the universe mm -hmm. rather than making really beautiful stuff up, um, right? <laughs> so they'll, yeah, they'll, they'll talk okay. about the... Um, Mathematicians will talk about these uh, Platonic or Aristotelian paradigms in in the sort of philosophy of mathematics. That mm -hmm. the Platonic paradigm um, states that mathematics uh, just is; it structures everything that is. It is it is outside time and space. It um, is eternal, um, and then uh, whatever it is that comes into being participates. And I mean, th this is just this is like straightforward theology, right? For for a monotheist, this is straightforward. Um, participates in this, and then it is the the job of the mathematician in a sort of uh, mystical priest like way to ascend to the <laughs> of those of those forms. Um, and then they tell you they're not religious, and then they tell you they're not they're not philosophers. And it's just like it's fascinating because that, that like they're more Platonists than the Platonists, and they're more theological than theologians. Um, so I, I think that there's a there's a there's a way that um, learning about and thinking about religion can help us learn and think about what it is that um, that the sciences do and how it is that they talk about themselves um, in really similar ways, often to the ways that our, our humanities and our social sciences have talked about themselves. So you do you agree with me that the, the mathematicians are doing philosophy? Um, and also perhaps doing religion. I think specifically theology. They are doing theology. Theology, yeah, yes, yes, yes. These are, this uh, is a theological statement. The statement that, that uh, the mathematical concepts exist outside of time and space and outside of human consciousness and matter, that, that is a theological statement. And then that what, what that makes is, that, is the, um, the everyday practice of mathematics into something like a religious discipline, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you, in another one of your videos, um, 
talk about a concept called disembodiment, um, which I found to be very interesting. And uh, you say the following thing. The move to disembody the monotheistic God denigrates anything that can't get away from its body. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I'm sorry to be like just pulling these random videos that might be online that you haven't thought about in, in maybe years and, and, and whatnot, but it's, it's an interesting idea. And the question I have for you is why? Mm -hmm. You know, um, is it not the case that like we're all subsumed in the all, so to speak, you know, and, and yet can have distinctions as individuals. Um, it seems, so in other words, it seems like you're describing like the body as a, a problem, right? It's like a problem for people as opposed to, to God who doesn't have a body and therefore is not like sort of oppressed by it. Um, and the analogy that I was uh, thinking of is like, you know, in the same way that a kettle is able to make peace, so to speak, between fire and water, right? It, it, by being divisive. Mm -hmm. um, it's this thing that joins something as opposed to divide something because if the two things were actually to touch, they mm -hmm. would annihilate each other, mm -hmm. so to speak. So um, I'm curious if you, if you have any general comments just about that, uh, that idea of disembodiment and, and the problem that you see there. Um, and, and if there's any type of synthesis to be found uh, through division as opposed to it being um, some kind of issue. Yeah. I mean, so in, in, in that sense, you know, God wouldn't be a kettle. God would be because that um, God would be sort of rigorously either on the side of well, probably a fire, right, rather than water, because um, God is understood only to occupy one side of um, one side of the mind body distinction. Um, I don't think bodies are a problem. I think bodies are very important. I think that is right. I'm <laughs> one of these people who thinks that consciousness is somehow uploadable and that it's uh, that our embodiment is incidental to our consciousness. I think it's the condition of possibility of our consciousness. Can you um, explain that just a little bit more before you go uh, on? Sure. Um, what, it, what I mean is that um, I don't think that our thinking and our um, bodies are too totally separate substances such that it makes sense to think mm. of like a mind in a vat, mm -hmm. um, right? Um, that uh, it is because our bodies are the way that they are, that our minds are able to think the kinds of things that they think. Um, and independently of those bodies, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to talk about mind. Um, so um, so from, from that perspective, I don't think bodies are a problem at all. We're all, we're all embodied, we're all uh, physiologically do I want to say this equally embodied? What I mean when I say, um, when I talk about people who can't get away from their bodies is, um, you know how when you take a gender studies class, suddenly um, almost everybody in the room is, is, is a woman, as though like only women have gender and men don't have gender. Um, and often if you take, uh, say, an African-American studies class, you get a lot mm -hmm. more black students than you get white students because it's understood that, you know, black folks have race and white folks don't have race. And right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and there there are there are there are people in in our world who are associated more with their bodies than other people are. Um, uh -huh. Women tend to be more associated with their bodies than men do. Um, black folk tend to be more associated with their skin than white folk do. Um, disabled people tend to be more associated with their body than able-bodied people do, who can sort of pretend that they don't have bodies. Um, so uh, this is what I mean, not that, that, that the fact of our embodiment is a problem, but that um, if we begin from the premise that consciousness is superior to material, Mm -hmm. that embodiment is superior to embodiment, then the folks who are able to attain an illusion of disembodiment um, tend to be privileged in a, a hierarchy of race and class and age and things like that. Um, so that's 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 really what I meant by that. Who is able to, to have that illusion? Uh, who are the people who transcend well, in that way? <laughs> The wealthier you are, the more you're able uh, not to have to worry so much about your body because your body is so well taken care of, right? right. It, doesn't, it doesn't talk back, but right. Um, again, the more able-bodied you are um, and and capable of moving around, the less you have to think about how on earth you're going to move around. Mm -hmm. um, 
the uh, certainly again the, the the wealthier you are and the more um, capable you are of like crossing state lines where laws might be different and more agreeable to what you want or need um, that your body and your your embodiment doesn't doesn't hold you down um, for those of us who are able to you know drive cars fairly regularly without just getting stopped randomly by the police right our bodies aren't holding us down um, as much as they do um, darker skinned folks who tend to get pulled over by police um, and you know I I, I had a um, I have a friend who's uh, an Episcopal priest, and uh, when she was eight months pregnant, a number of the parishioners were saying, like, can you stop celebrating the Mass, please, because it's, like, really uncomfortable for us to see a pregnant person trying to, that, like, somehow her mm -hmm. body, they couldn't get past her body mm -hmm. to the kind of God they needed to get to, right? That That's her body was in the way. Um, right. So th th these, are, these are some examples of, right, folks whose bodies kind of get in the way. Okay, understood. Um, I have two, time for two more questions, I think. And um, this has been really in, enjoyable um, and, and I really appreciate it, but a um, couple more ideas. Yeah. Um, in your thinking, what does it mean for a religion specifically to be successful? And mm -hmm. are there religions that are more successful than others? And how would we define that longevity? number of adherents, uh, the, the effect on the practitioners. How would you look at that? There is a, a scholar of religion, um, Jonathan Z. Smith, who just died a few years ago. Um, I don't know if you know him, but he was sort of no. old, as old as the heavens and he looked like Moses in a sort of long flowing beard. And, um, and he was, he was uh, beautiful and wonderful. And uh, he is known for having said that a religious movement can never get off the ground if it doesn't heal people, that that's, mm -hmm. that's what a religion needs to do. Um, so from that kind of sociological perspective, I think a successful religion is a religion that heals people. Um, one that, yeah, one that heals people um, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, um, that, that, that tends to get, get religions off the ground. Um, what would it mean um, politically for a religion to be successful? <laughs> no, not, not, well, you could answer it that way, but I don't think that either one of us is, would be so interested, uh, you know, in that. But metaphysically, you know, I think it makes sense to heal people, you know, to, to provide people with what their souls mm -hmm. crave, you know, and need and set them on a, on a good path um, mm -hmm. where, you know, life is working for them in, in, a, in, a, in a better way. Oh, well, um, yeah. Yeah, I just, you know, um, there are lots of ways that people look at the success of, you know, various religious movements. And I and I wonder how often it is that people say what you're saying, which is like, how, how is it working for people? You know, what, what, what are the, what's the net result in terms of how you're doing as a result of inter interfacing with this series, you know, this body of ideas? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it interests me quite a lot, you know, the, the degree to which religions can be more effective in doing that, you know, um, and whether even their own core tenets can be mined, you know, uh, on a deeper level um, mm -hmm. and and taught and practiced better, you know, and there's a whole question of whether or not we're hitting the right notes in um, in our practice, you know, and, and whether the the teachers of the practice are, are good at teaching, you know, um, and a whole bunch of different questions about how we're doing, you know, um, and oftentimes I think we're doing well and oftentimes i think we're doing not well um and and want to push the boundaries a, a little further um but i appreciate your answer and and my last question in the two minutes that i have is um this is one of those sort of general concluding kind of questions um which is i was wondering if you were invited to a forum of all the religious leaders on earth mm -hmm. and you could deliver one message to them as a philosopher of religion, what, what would you want to say? Um, I'd, I'd say resist. <laughs> please continue <laughs> to resist. Um, uh, please continue to hold on. And now we're going to get to what I didn't say. <laughs> Sorry about the um, political success of religion. Um, please hold on to whatever it is your tradition teaches you about um, a, another way that this world could be, right? A different, a different logic according to which we might live. 
Um, it, the, the recently the um, ecumenical patriarch, the Archbishop of Canterbury and mm. the, uh, the, the and Pope Francis all co-signed a letter um, calling for immediate climate action um, right now in the face of an earth that, and this is, you know, from a <laughs> Trinitarian perspective, right? This is not a pantheistic perspective at all. Um, on, on behalf of an earth God has created um, and, and God has entrusted into human hands. Um, and nobody listened to it um, because nobody much seems to care what the ecumenical patriarch and the Archbishop of Canterbury and Pope Francis have to say um, in terms of, but um, if we could get all of them, maybe, <laughs> maybe, uh, <laughs> We could we could encourage them um, to uh, hold on to what these traditions teach about the sanctity of uh, of Earth, um, re regardless of whether it is inherently sacred or God created it or it created itself, whatever it is, um, and uh, and to bring those uh, bring those perspectives into um, back to the UN and to I don't know refuse to bury anybody until we take serious, we will not bury anybody, we will not name anybody, we're not gonna circumcise anybody, we're not gonna baptize anybody until you take meaningful action on climate change. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so Professor Rubenstein, thank you so much <laughs> for being here. That was such a great conversation and you, you, I, I love your work and, your, and the way you communicate it. So um, thank you so much for being here and for the audience. Uh, please subscribe, like, share, comment, and stay abreast of all the great stuff we have going on on our YouTube channel. And we will see you next time with more fascinating people and great insights. Thank you so much for being here.